he gave me a statement on recording. The state then doesn't ask Mr. Bean in front of the jury, doesn't ask him in front when he's here to be cross-examined. They come up to Judge Glanville ex parte, give him some sort of document that supposedly shows Mr. Bean is scared, which I doubt. This is just me doubt, I have no evidence. And then in the middle of that document says that Brian Steele and his investigators, I'm not quoting, were in a car with Mr. Bean and his son. And Brian Steele was telling Mr. Bean what to say. And his son has that on recording. That never happened. That never happened. But what Ms. Love was allowed to say in front of the jury, believe it or not, did Mr. Steele stop and start that recording? Mr. Bean said, what he always says, I don't recall. I, I objected outrageous, outrageous. It just flows right through. The same way Ms. Love stands here today and says, it's, it's hard to hear or whatever her words are, hard to decipher on an Apple iPhone. I, that did not happen. It is offensive. The legal analysis is wrong. There is no distinction in Georgia on substantive or impeachment. What you were told is wrong. And this lawyer knows it because she sat here in court and I did the same thing without being tempered. All right. That's four times. Thank you for clarifying that. Do you have any Georgia law that represents what you have asserted in your motion and amended motion? Your Honor, that's just it. I have been clear in my amended motion and also I just want to say that Georgia law does not define, it does not define a case in chief. It does not break it down. We all know what a case in chief is. I mean, don't we? I think we all know what a case in chief is. Is there any support for your assertion that discovery is, reciprocal discovery is required based on the concept of substantive evidence? Your Honor, what I have said and what I maintain is that one, there is an absence and I'll point the court to three different cases, Harris v. Estate 314, Georgia 238 is one. And these are just instances. 238? What did you say? Yes. What are the other two and what are they going to represent? 307, Georgia 171, which is the 2019 Green case that Mr. Steele cited for the court and 146, Georgia App 423, which is Phillips v. Estate. And we've... When is that from? I'm sorry. What year? Oh, just one second, Your Honor. That's a 78 case. Okay, so that one's not relevant at all. Okay. Because we have a new evidence code since 78, so. Okay. And Your Honor, even with respect to the old case, the only thing that I was citing Phillips for was the proposition that in the absence of specific legislative or decisional case law on the particular issue that is at hand in Phillips, we commend the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure Rule 16 for guidance. All right, well, we've got a specific rule here now, don't we? Well, when you say we have a specific rule, is the court speaking of the discovery statute that says... That's what we're talking about in this motion, right? Right, yes, Your Honor. We are talking about that and the state's position, the state maintained, first of all, let me be real clear, we didn't file a brief. This is the first brief that we have filed where we asserted these things. We have asked that the court require Mr. Steele to turn this stuff over, but we never argued it out. Mr. Steele has stood up and said he's not required to, and he has pointed to the 
discovery statute, the court has said, okay, yeah, he doesn't. And we put that in our um, motion to the court that the court has previously made a ruling that we thought deserved um, a second look at. Um, Mr. S w Defendant Williams has adopted as his witnesses all the state's witnesses in the witness list that he filed. And so, Your Honor, when we assert based on Waddell, and Waddell also speaks about work product and it makes this distinction between factual history and work product and what the state or is and is not entitled. The state stands on its assertion regarding what the requirements are because of the fact that I understand the court's position that there's no, uh, that there's no misunderstanding about what case in chief means in Georgia, but as there was this um, expounding on its meaning in uh, Waddell, I think it's important to, to recognize that it has not, there's not been a similar sort of expounding in Georgia, and we can all presume or take for granted that it just means when the defendant when is you're putting up this particular witness. Case. Right. Okay, so do you have any case law in Georgia, Georgia that supports the position you took in your motion that uh, reciprocal discovery requirements are triggered based on whether you're presenting something as substantive evidence? That's my question to you. Your Honor, the only, um, what we have in support of the motion is cited in the um, amendment and in the motion itself, we have not ever presented or represented to the court that there was a Georgia case that addressed this issue. And the um, conclusion that is asserted in the state's filings are the result of the fact that one, from our position, it's not addressed directly that, you know, what case in chief specifically. <laughs> so you were telling me that when our discovery statute says that the defendant is produced to produce um, or permit inspection copying of whatever it is that they're in possession or control of, which the defendant intends to introduce as evidence in the defense case in chief or rebuttal at the trial, you think that there's some kind of lack of clarity about what that means? Is that what you're representing to the court? Your Honor, I'm representing that. That was the position that was taken. That was what was uh, analyzed in the cases that we have cited in our amended um, amendment and supplement to our motion to compel. Um, that is, in our position, a, um, a reasonable interpretation. And as we, as we, as I don't, as we've said in our filing, Your Honor, um, there was the requirement in Waddell that anything that was within the defendant's possession, custody, or control, where the defendant intended to use the item in the defendant's case in chief, that that be turned over. The Waddell court, Your Honor, in analyzing the meaning and understanding of case in chief, as the court correctly pointed out earlier, said that if it is going to be used as both impeachment and substantive evidence, that that constitutes case in chief. From there, we made the assertion, the state's position, that if they intend, if the defense intends, because there's nothing in Georgia law that analyzes it at this level, if the defense intends to introduce evidence as both impeachment and substantive evidence, then they have a duty to disclose it. And that is the origin of the state. And that is the basis for our position of time. And, and have you heard Mr. Steele argue two or three times before um, that that's not at all what Georgia law means? We've not made this argument before. So I don't mean in writing. Y'all have not no, had we any discussion whatsoever not, well, in we front of Judge Glanville about as I have said in my motion, Your Honor, what we have argued, the state has said, Your Honor, they have a duty to disclose this. This is stuff that we are entitled. And Mr. Steele has said no, inciting the Georgia statute. He said, we do not. I have never asserted. I've never made this distinction. I've never said that it, that case in chief 
means if it's being presented as impeachment as substantive evidence. I've never made that. I've never made that argument in a written or oral filing. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I would like for you to take your duty of candor to the court with a little bit more seriousness in the future. Ms. Uh, I respectfully, I take it very seriously. <laughs> So um, anyway, we'll be abiding by the um, discovery requirements set forth in our statutes. And Mr. Steele, thank you for the clarification. All right, I think that brings us to the issue of when we first met, um, Mr. Short had suggested that there might be, well, I don't know if it was Mr. Short or Ms. Love, honestly, one or the other of you. We discussed the possibility that there might be outstanding discovery that maybe actually was required to be produced that either was missing or just hadn't been talked about. And I wanted us to kind of go through in detail what it is that everybody thinks maybe the other side has that they're entitled to that they haven't gotten yet. So are we in a position to be able to do that now? If not, we can do it tomorrow or the next day and we can move on to we've got other stuff to do too. Um, which exhibits have actually been admitted? That's an easier one for this afternoon. Which would y'all run? We gotta do them both, so I don't really care which order we take them in. Okay, so can we do them um, today? I think Mr. Steele provided a, sort of as a starting point a list or a chart or a spreadsheet or something. Um, his understanding of what exhibits have actually be actually been admitted. Um, and for us to take this pause is a good time to make sure we're all on the same page about that. Um, and I know that Miss um, Weaver, the court reporter, had at least provided to me, but I don't know whether she copied y'all or not, um, a couple of places based on that chart where she thought she wanted some clarification or she thought maybe it had been talked about but not actually admitted so we can go through all of those. Do y'all have that or do I need to get y'all that? Your Honor, we have, um, we have that. I believe that that might be a love trap. We have been keeping um, a list as well and okay. referencing um, the reported proceedings to ensure that we are accurately keeping notes of what has been and has been admitted. Right. Like I said earlier, um, there have been instances where it has been proper that evidence has been admitted, has been tendered, um, right. that, that, that has not been the case. So we are still, and we ask the court, allow us to get a little bit further along in uh, checking all of these exhibits. All right, so. Whether it's really or truly been So the question was do y'all have the, um, the, kind of response from Ms. Weaver about her take on a couple of discrepancies. Okay. Miss um, uh, Hersfield, could you share that with everybody? And um, I was I was hoping that we could do this today. That the state is not ready to yet. Um, you know, I, I, I want to try to take us to the end of the day because we have a lot of work to do. Um, maybe there's something else that we still need to cover that we can cover today. Yes, we have um, here um, each piece of evidence and we are comparing our record to okay. the actual physical piece of evidence um, that we have submitted or the business submitted. So that um, in okay. our uh, I'm sure it's time consuming, voluminous. And we have been okay. to make sure that it's accurate, so. Well, that'll be.
be helpful. <laughs> we would want that. All right. So, um, Miss Percival will email out to y'all all um, the the couple of comments that Miss Weaver, in her looking back, um, believes might be inaccurate on the uh, chart that Mr. Steele has put together and shared with everybody. So y'all can take a look at that. We can, we can deal with it tomorrow. Um, I know one thing that we're going to need to sort out. Um, Ms. Weaver had mentioned that there are times when, and I think she said it was, I don't know who, but somebody on the defense side or maybe more than one person on the defense side, uh, I don't know if the state's doing it as well or not, but you will approach a witness with a laptop and show them something on the laptop and ask them about it. And that it is difficult for the court reporter to then sort out what was that exhibit actually? And I don't know if anything has been admitted that way, but um, I do know that judge, uh, the prior judge, there is an administrative order um, in April in this case that um, requires all evidence offered by any counsel be submitted to the court in physical form and marked as appropriate at the time of its admission for it to be properly made a part of the record and directing counsel to provide physical copies to the official court reporter who now obviously is no longer Ms. Weaver for going forward. It is um, going to be our um, new court reporter, Ms. Winfrey. Um, but we need, we actually need you know, electronic copies too, but we need something that is physical, whether it's on a jump drive or a flash drive or whether it's a piece of paper. Um, there's no way for the court reporter to capture sort of, I guess, a screenshot, unless y'all take a screenshot of the screen that you're showing the witness and then give that piece of paper or, or electronic file to the court reporter. That'd be fine, but there has to be something it represents whatever you showed the witness on the screen, okay? So everybody understand? Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Um, so we can take up tomorrow after y'all had a chance to look at it, um, the, the couple of issues that um, Miss Miss Weaver's got a different record than what Mr. Steele does. And then I would love for y'all to be able to get together on if there's no discrepancy then we don't have to worry about it if everybody's on the same page um but uh, you know if if there is a discrepancy if y'all don't talk to each other maybe you could just email each other um here's where we think there might be a question or an issue so that we all know before we talk about it what it is that we need to talk about so can y'all do that this evening Jennifer, thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, all right. The state has provided a, an updated witness list, which is still fairly long. Um, and I would like to know from the state does that list include, is that just the witnesses that are, have been called yet that still need to be called? Or does that include everybody, the witnesses who have been called and those who are still to be called? Your Honor, that includes the witnesses that need to be called. Some have already been called, but yes. those are um, uh, everyone. Who yeah, there were a few you highlighted and said we may recall these. So that is 105 or so witnesses still to go. No. Yes. Okay. And is that with y'all narrowing it down and picking only the witnesses y'all need? Yes. Okay. That, we'll, we'll see. But, um, <clears throat> all right, are there any other, the, you know, we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with Mr. Copeland's sort of redo, but are there any other motions that I haven't gotten to yet today or mentioned today that are outstanding I, um, I emailed, uh, your 
Victoria's Secrets regarding motions that I filed against because I did not have access to Odyssey and I could not pull them off the internet. I did not have the file copies on my computer. I identified what they were, but they were um, noted, essentially, I, I would think they're kind of notices of objection. Uh, they were regarding, regarding the internet, I know this, it was wiretap in this case. There's, um, then also my client's phone, actually two phones, were extracted from the office. So there's numerous um, phone calls, texts, emails, things of that nature that are on either the wiretap that were uh, intercepted, some involving my some with my client as a part of those communications, some not. Um, as well as all the things that are typically on a cell phone that deal with someone's essential life on an electronic device. The state um, has, to my knowledge, not identified what they have used from either of those um, sources of information at this time. I think that's why I'm able to notice that there is relevant information, there is prejudicial information, there's on the wiretap, not so much uh, Mr. Stilwell, but there's other individuals on these wiretaps discussing all sorts of other acts that have nothing to do with this case. And so there's just a lot there, and we're going to need to have that discussion at some time. Okay, thank you. Um, when does the state intend to let the defense know what it is they're actually using out of the universe of all possible things. Still being in any way efficient with the jury's time, you're not essentially. Okay. All right. I, that's just not practical. I mean, we're going to change that going forward, and I'm not going to say I need you to know everything tomorrow because I know it's a voluminous case. But y'all been putting this case together for two years, and. You ought to know, I mean, you clearly know what witnesses you're going to be using, and you've given me, you know, kind of a very broad idea of what exhibits you intend to use with those witnesses, but I don't know that if, if we're just every other week saying, okay, let's, let's, let's figure out all of the evidentiary issues that have to do with the next two weeks worth of witnesses, we can do that in one day on a Friday. We just can't. So we're not going to be able, I mean, we all know that we've got this week, and we know that uh, the jury has already been told before I became involved that they essentially have the week of, um, what is it, August, August 19th out? So, you know, this week might be taken up pretty much with sorting out the two things I just mentioned and then sorting out all of the evidence that goes along with Mr. Copeland because he's our next witness up. But the week of August 19th, we need to be plowing through a whole 
lot of other evidence, not just what's coming up in the next two weeks. We need to be covering the next several months, which ought to be, frankly, the end of this trial by them. I mean, it, it should not take another seven months. It shouldn't. Whether it does or not, I don't know. But um, So the state needs to produce in much more detail a much more winnowed down um, a comprehensive list of what the evidence they intend to use with each witness is going to be so that the defense can see it, evaluate it, make whatever evidentiary objections they have to it, and the court can have some time to view the evidence, listen to the evidence, whatever the evidence is, and evaluate the evidentiary issues so that we know by the time the witness gets on the stand, here's what is coming in. I mean, for the most part, it's a trial, but what's coming in and what has already been excluded. So do I need to be more explicit about that? Or do y'all understand your marching orders? All right. So I, I feel like I need to be more explicit about it, even though I know y'all understand. Um, by the beginning of next week, I want to see, you know, at least the next 30 witnesses worth of evidence, okay? And then maybe by the end of that week, the next 30, okay? All right, and we're going to plan to be here all of the 19th, and I don't know when 